All righty. Well, good day. Hello, Mel. How are you doing? I am good, Dan. How are you going? I'm I'm well. I'm well. Um, all things considered, <laughs> COVID life considered. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing I know. Okay. I'm trying to work out whose COVID life is 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 worse. I I know for for you, your plans were sort of scuppered, and that the teams have sort of put you into a lockdown. But I've got a feeling lockdown in Monaco has got to be much better than lockdown in Sydney at the moment. I. I mean, well, actually, I'll say yes. And the main reason why I'll say yes is because it's summer here. So it's like 20, yeah, it's, it's 27 degrees. So I'm not going to complain. Um, but I feel like probably for the majority of lockdown, I, I feel like you guys have had it a bit better than Europe. Um, oh, we have. We, we absolutely, we absolutely have. So, um, you know, I think that's the challenge, though. We've had it so good. So then when we get these lockdowns, it ends up being kind of hard. But you know what us Aussies are like? Everyone's staying optimistic. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I um well, speaking of optimistic and optimism and optus and all things starting with OPT. <laughs> um, <laughs> I I was gonna turn the tables today. I was I'm normally the one being asked questions. I'm normally the one with the microphone in my face and, and all of that, but I feel like there is a lot that I could also learn from you and a lot that you could share. So if it's okay, I'm going to ask you some questions today. What do you think? I am all up for it as long as it has nothing to do with racing a Formula One car because I'm not sure I can help there. I think we're safe. I think we're safe. Okay. But even if there was, I'll, I'll carry you. I'll carry you through that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, well, yeah, I, the first one I, I wanted to basically ask. So you lead a huge and incredible team. Uh, so how do you manage to stay so connected to so many people and make sure as a whole that the Optus team members feel supported in their career goals? Yeah, it's a, it's a really, really good um, question. Look, I, I really believe in a really authentic leadership style and, and really building a sort of psychologically safe environment where people feel trusted and they can be themselves. Um you know, my career is I've sort of worked my way up from, from the bottom. So I think that that is also really important because I'd never ask anyone in my team to do something I wouldn't be prepared to do myself. But more importantly, um, I connect with, with everyone as individuals. I see leadership as a really huge, huge responsibility. It's an honour, but it's a huge responsibility because you impact people's daily lives. And, and sometimes you impact them positively and sometimes you impact them negatively either um, without wanting to or, or often you need to make that call. So um, the, the best thing is just talking and, and getting to know people, letting everyone know where they stand. And I also sort of throw in a good, good dose of humour. That's good. Yeah, I, I feel like the last thing someone wants to be is, I think like um, a leader has to have a certain amount of authority, so to speak. But the last thing also like that you don't want your peers to feel like <laughs> nervous to walk into the workplace or intimidated or <laughs> so I think breaking it up with some, some humor and, and as you say, like really getting to know them, I think helps and certainly breaks the ice for those who might be a little more, uh, uh, I don't know, not everyone's as outgoing or, you know, some, some are shy. So I think that's that's nice to have that connection with them. Yeah, I guess I'm interested from your take too because, you know, to you, you're just Daniel, but, you know, you for a, a lot of people that you work with in the first time probably are intimidating. My my hubby, um, as you know, has spent a, a large portion of his career working in F1 and, and he tells his story when he was at McLaren and I think it was about 1990, 91, where he was leaning over into the um, car and doing up Ayrton Senna's um, seatbelt. But he said his hands were trembling. You know, this is a guy he'd looked up to. And he said just through the visor, Ayrton gave him a wink. But, um, I mean, do you find that with a lot of the guys that and girls, actually, that you work with, that they find you quite intimidating the first time they meet you? It's it's something you kind of <laughs> you try to ignore or never want to admit, and of course it's not the case with everyone. But 
I'd be lying if I said I hadn't I hadn't noticed it um, on occasions. And I think one actually was when when I went from Red Bull to Renault, it was like the most like high profile move of that season. And I think I think quite a few people at Renault probably read too many articles and headlines and it was like it was a it was a bigger deal for them you know with with me coming so I felt like yeah first day at work people were just shy to even like say hi to me and if I went to go and you know introduce myself that were taken back like oh like why is he talking to me like I'm not that important or like you could just tell they were they were really some of them were really in their shell and um I felt bad because I was like like I'm I'm not trying to (laughs) overpower you I'm just trying to to be nice and, and start start something but uh yeah I you do feel it sometimes but uh again I think the best way to break that is again as you say to be authentic to be yourself and and just to let them know that you're you're just like them you are a human and um we all have feelings and we all also just have a, a passion and a love for the same thing so that's that's pretty cool yeah so Mel can you tell us a bit about your story uh how did you achieve one of my favorite words coming up such a prolific position. <laughs> um, I love that word too. Look, it wasn't deliberate. Um, I always had um, major ambitions to be um, successful, but I didn't wake up thinking I was going to be a CMO. Um, when I left school, I really wanted to be a, a producer uh, for 60 Minutes and I spent a couple of years working in, in TV production. Um, but I also... Um, had a love of, of motorsport and um, I, I got a great opportunity to go and, and do the PR for V8 supercars, 500cc bikes, drag racing and I really felt that I had a major major passion with, with the sport, with the adrenaline um, and, and the impact and you know I work with some amazing people like um, Barry Sheen, um, may you rest in peace, um, uh, you know, amazing uh, motorcycle riders like uh, Louis Capriossi and um, the V8 uh, drivers and, and then some of the Formula One team down in Adelaide. And then from there, I ended up moving um, into looking up automotive advertising and that became a journey of advertising for me for many years, bulk of it spent in the UK um, where I worked on amazing brands um, like your favourite drink, Malibu, uh, and um, Absolute Vodka. Um, I I worked on uh, brands like the British Army uh, for years, which um, I still hold dear to my heart. That was very, very special looking after the recruitment and specifically infantry recruitment with with the Army and travelling with them um and and then an opportunity came up to go client side so i jumped and and went to vodafone in in the uk and and looked after 23 of the markets there and that's where i sort of got into my marketing gig and and role and yeah here i am now at optus all right so you said a lot of stuff there but (laughs) i've i've taken two main things from that one is that I'm insulted that you think I'm a Malibu drinker. <laughs> <laughs> is Malibu, is that like a pina colada? Uh, is that what they well, put in no, a pina it's, colada? it's a coconut-based rum. And actually, it's right for you because its its whole tagline is seriously easygoing. So, <laughs> all right, not, all right. Okay, yeah. What, what's the second thing? No, this, the second one is I'm trying to come up with, so... I can relate to obviously traveling the world and just gaining so much life experience. And I feel there should be a bit of a tagline that relates to that. You know, they say like um, health is wealth. Yeah. I feel there should be one with travel is something, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's a privilege to travel the world and, and gain so much experience. And I, I can certainly relate to a lot of the uh, experiences that you've had. Yeah, no, it's um, it's amazing. All right, so I think uh, a lot of people love talking about career highlights and basically everyone wants to feel good stories, but I think lowlights is also important to touch on because uh, I'm sure that you would have learnt 
through some of your low, uh, low lights, let's call them, or mistakes, or they've helped you grow. So is there anything that comes to mind or a, a tough moment in your life which you actually really took something from and it, it kind of changed your course for the better? Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting sort of looking back now at, at, in the moment things felt like they were um, devastating and my life was going to be over from a career perspective, but actually I've taken learnings from them. Um, I think there's probably three. Um, I think the, the first one for me is the years and years and years and years I wasted with imposter syndrome, not thinking... I was, I was good enough uh, and I was up to it. Um, the, the times that I let what I would call dirty thoughts in, in my mind and what I mean by dirty thoughts is not, not what you're thinking, but, um, you know, people will try to pull you down and they can be really negative and be quite personal and, and sort of in a passive aggressive way try to attack you. I spent far too long letting those thoughts occupy my mind. And the, and the danger is you sort of secretly start believing them. Um, so I think, I think there would be, it would be probably that. And then the final thing for me is um, calling sooner when the culture is not right. I think, you know, you as an individual do not have the power to change an entire culture of an organization. And, if it just doesn't feel right, you don't have the right values with the people that you're working with, um, no matter how much the paycheck is, um, it's, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's it's not worth it. Like life is, life is too short and you are motivated and you get energy from the people that you work with and you want, you want similar values. I mean, I guess for you, you, you you have had the opportunity to consider a number of Formula One teams and I'm not going to ask you to disclose them, but do you also, when you're, when you're choosing a team, um, think about the culture? The col yeah, the, the culture is a big one um, because, like, the culture dictates your, yeah, your happiness, your feeling, your enjoyment, um, your kind of sense of belonging. Um, so, yeah, it was, you know, I, I think that was, uh, there was kind of a lot of, let's say, little reasons which left me to feeling like, you know, leaving Red Bull or moving on from Red Bull was the right thing at the time. And I was, um, I was kind of concerned with the culture, but also what, what my place in the culture looked like moving yeah. forward. And I felt like I was going to become slightly more frustrated, um, probably more complacent. Everything yeah. is just a little bit too easy. So, yeah, it's, it, it plays a big role, absolutely. Yeah, I agree with you. But then, I mean, if you take that as a comparison, that culture is right for Max. And I think, you know, we are all individuals, which is why it's really important to find the, the cultural fit right for who you are as a person and what drives you. Absolutely. And I think, yeah, what you touch on is just like, what works for you and that's that's so important i think people in general have to not be afraid to put themselves first you know like it's okay to be selfish and especially when it comes to your career and eventually you know what what will be a big part of your life like you have to do what feels right for you and that might yeah. not be the same as the person next to you but yeah that's um that's a bit of just encouragement for everyone i guess yeah, i agree with <laughs> uh, you i agree with you and then, so I've seen, so outside of your work at Optus, um, you share a lot about mental health and you're actually on the board of Batia. Um, so basically, what does that involve? And why is that an issue that's important to you? Yeah, so um, I didn't really have the confidence to come out and share this publicly until about three years ago, but um, I suffer from severe depressive disorder and I think that shocked many people because they see me as an upbeat, um, bubbly individual. And, you know, I I'd had a number of episodes and, you know, one that, um, you know, uh, resulted with me being hospitalised actually in, in the UK. Um, and I felt it was important to come out and, and share that, you know, strong strong leaders also can, can have challenges around mental health. 
Um, I'm asked to sit on lots of boards and, and what really grabbed me about the TIA is it is all focused on destigmatizing mental health for youth. Um, so they run programs by individuals that have had lived experience and they have a really, really big belief that if you start destigmatizing mental health and you talk about it, that um, people won't be so scared. I mean, sadly, for under 18 males in Australia, the biggest killer is suicide. And um, that sort of stuff actually really, really breaks my heart. So I, I absolutely love what Batir stand for because I don't think in the mental health space there is a lot of focus on prevention. Um, it's wide, like mental health can go from anxiety to, to people that have diagnosed issues and, 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 and diseases. But I think the, the other thing that is really, really important about it is um, this little word that I learned going through it is there's public stigma. The biggest barrier for anyone with any mental health challenge is self-stigma. And that was my that was my challenge for the majority of my life that you know, there was something wrong with me. I could mentally fight my way out of this. I could be better than this. And, you know, I've got a bit of a, you know, chemical imbalance and, you know, hereditary sort of view that makes that happen. But it's important people talk about it and, and it's okay. And I realise actually now my mental health challenges are actually sort of part of who I am and, and now my strengths. That's, um, I think that's amazing. And it's so, uh, I think just in general, like talking, like you need, you need, and I guess that's what like friends are for. If, if, if your family's not there, like that's why you have close friends at the end of the day, to talk to them, to, to basically unload and to, to listen as well. And that's what close friends do. And I think it's, you know, that is like such a big first step to anything. And even from a, like, a, sorry, sorry to, uh, like, turn it to me, but, like, for my racing, like, if I'm having a yeah. bad day or things aren't, aren't working well, then I need to talk to someone about it and I need to unload. And then it's like, okay, now I can move forward. And absolutely, if, if people are suffering with mental health and they're just bottling it up, bottling it up and got no one to, to release anything to, then for sure that's, you know, that's step one of, many kind of steps afterwards that, that become more difficult. So, um, yeah, that's really cool. I, and I, I like from a, I'd say just like society where it's at now, like the, that people are, and thanks to like yourself, you know, people are putting themselves out there and it's not such a, it's not such a, what, what's the word, like a taboo subject or something yeah. like. No, you know, absolutely. It's, yeah. yeah. Um, it's giving people a lot of confidence to talk about it. So that's cool. Yeah. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. So I'm glad you found some uh, some ways to, to deal with it and to cope with it and, and that you're also inspiring and helping others. So that's really nice. Thank you. All right. So I am very often asked <laughs> how I maintain my positive and focused attitude, uh, but I'm more interested now in how you maintain an optimistic mindset. It's really, really interesting that you sort of say that. So I am I am told that I am just like a bundle of energy when I come into to a room and that I'm energetic and, and, and always optimistic. Um, I think that's what I, 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 you know, on the whole, I'd say I'm mostly glass half full. Um, how do I stay that way? I, I love getting energy from other individuals around me and then I find when I'm optimistic or I look at the positive situation, you end up getting that positive energy back off people. I also, I love challenges. I love a bit of a crisis. I love things that are messy. I, I love trying to sort of sort those things out. So that, that is part of me. I think one of the things I've learned, however, is... 98% of the time, I am so optimistic and so many people lean on me to, to drag that through teams and the business. So the 2% of the time when I'm not, 
it actually probably has a bigger effect. And I, I find it frustrating. Like people are like, Mel, you can't be like that. You, you know, what is wrong with you? And it's sort of like, Christ, I'm just having a bad day. I, I can't be having the, you know, I'm optimistic all the time. So that that's the one downside. I don't know about you that the moment you, you your armour chinks and then I get frustrated going, so-and-so's grumpy all the time and you never t- talk to them about it. I don't know if that's the same with you. So a very like one moment which stands out uh, at the kind of forefront of all that was Monaco 2016 when I was leading the team did the, let's say the bad pit stop and I lost the race and I was stood there on the podium just I, I couldn't I couldn't smile. I was like I was still seeing red. And all the comments was about like, oh my gosh, like this kid can actually get angry. Like, oh wow. Like I, I thought I thought he just smiled twenty four seven. I was like, yes, I do most of the time, but of course things get me. Like this is my career and I've worked so hard for this. So like do you expect me to be smiling? So yeah, it's uh it's funny. It's funny how that works. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, I think I think look, some people are inherently optimistic, but I think that you can also learn to have a really optimistic mindset. And 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 for me, an optimistic mindset is just looking that there's always a better option and there's always a better way. Absolutely, absolutely. It's it all comes down to perspective, and it's like the way you, um, yeah, the way you approach. Uh, a situation is exactly you've got the choice whether to go I think you said it before glass half full or glass half empty and then yeah, absolutely are your family inherently optimistic like is your dad more serious or your mum more thoughtful uh, that's such a good question so I think because they're like my parents I've never viewed them as anything other than my parents yeah. <laughs> that's crazy um I would honestly have to think about that but for sure, like, I mean, I am a product of them and growing up in a, in a nice, warm, kind of loving household. Yeah. So for sure, it was a, it was a nice environment with, with lots of laughs and smiles and, and affection. So yeah, it, it would be. But could I tell you, like, out of mum or dad, who is more so? I'd have to probably think about that one. Yeah. Okay. Well, next time we catch up, I expect an answer to that. All right. All right. That's my yeah. homework. Okay. All right. Well, we'll finally, Mel. Um, just some advice, the last one is, is really some advice for those starting out in their careers. Um, what, to, what would today's Mel say to a younger Mel? Don't compare yourself with those around you. Everyone is going to go on their own journey and you'll have times when people you feel are at the same level as you accelerate um, and then others that, that go backwards. Write your own story and go your own path. I, I never imagined I'd get to the heights that I am now. And I'll be honest, I'm not giving up. Like, I, I want to go further. But there are times when I felt a bit despondent because others were ahead of me and I didn't necessarily think it is fair. But, you know, life is a journey. So just focus, focus on your own story. And look, my final thing is be a student of life, be curious, discover learn things I'm, I'm a big believer that life lessons like you know heartbreak from your first you know true love is is really important in building who you are losing jobs not getting what you want makes you actually better and and stronger so look at it as an amazing amazing learning experience that's powerful I uh I, I couldn't agree more I think these like a uh, for uh, you touch on like a heartbreak like yes that is painful and it hurts but those feelings and emotions you get from something like that it's it's like it makes you also feel alive and it makes you want to I don't know um there's like you can also take yeah I guess just power and and like positive emotion from from a, a bad place or a bad time or um yeah, so I, I agree, just like life experience and it's very simple, but like it sounds so cliche, but you we get we'll get one chance at this. So like why not make the most of it? Why not test yourself, challenge yourself, scare yourself, like do all these things. 
No, I agree. And um, a uh, fabulous Formula One driver, uh, Nikki Ladder, um, has an amazing quote that, that I use actually with my team. And, and I don't know if you know it, so I'm going to throw it out there. But the, the quote from, from Nikki was um, from success, you learn absolutely nothing. From failures and setbacks, conclusions can be drawn. And that goes for your private life as well as your career. True. It's true. And it's, <laughs> it's, I, I don't, I don't want to, I want to leave it there because that's like, that's the, I think that's such a nice way to end it, but I, I can't help but, <laughs> but say like from personal experience, success, you're right. You learn nothing because you win a race, for example, and it's like high fives, it's, it's hugs, yeah. it's champagne, it's and then it's like well, let's go out and party and you do like no analysis of the race you do like it's just let's celebrate and you actually like if you go to the core of it you don't really learn much because it's like everything's just a big high and uh yeah. that's like a little snapshot but it's it's an example of where that that can certainly be the truth well mel thank you so much uh it has been great talking to you and I've enjoyed listening. I, I still obviously <laughs> chimed in here and there, but I, I did enjoy asking the questions and, and taking a back seat. So thank you so much. And that was really, uh, it was quite a, quite a privilege to hear a lot of that uh, insight from yourself. So appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. And just so great to, to talk and, and riff off you as well.